On to introduce today's speaker, we're very, very happy to welcome Professor Catherine Milan of uh, the University of South Africa. Um, to give you some background on the speaker, she's an associate professor in the Department of Decision Sciences at UNISA. She received her BSc to MSc degrees from the University of Cape Town and her PhD in Computer Science from the University of Pretoria in 2014. She has over 20 years of lecturing experience, mostly in computer science at three different South African universities and has co-authored two programming textbooks. She currently holds an NRFC1 rating for research, that's for 2020 to 2024, and her research interests include automated algorithm selection in optimization and learning, fitness landscape analysis, and the application of computational intelligence techniques to real world problems. And today she will be presenting a seminar with us entitled Recent Developments in the Analysis of Neural Network Error Landscapes. So please join me in welcoming uh, Professor Milan and please can you kick us off? Thank you. Right, can you, can you hear me? Yes, okay. Prof, we can hear. Right. Fantastic. Okay, so thank you everybody for, for being here. Um, I must move on to my title. There we go. So that's, uh, but um, Diane's already said, that's what I'm gonna be talking about. So I'm in um, the Department of Decision Sciences. Um, we're a somewhat unusual um, academic entity because we're sitting in economic and management sciences, but we mostly fairly scientific. So we a bunch of mathematicians and statisticians and computer scientists together. Um, but what's nice about being in economic and management sciences is it's very much focused on problem solving and decision making. So um, it's that's where I'm based. Right, so let's get to it. But just before I before I start with the actual content, I just would like to acknowledge that quite a lot of the research that I'm going to be talking about today is um, captured in uh, the thesis, uh, PhD thesis of Anna Bosman, uh, Ney Rakitianskaya. Um, so, so a lot of the work that I've done is in collaboration with Anna and, and some of the research that I'm going to be talking about was, was, is, is in, her, in her thesis. So just to acknowledge that it's not just me. <laughs> Um, involved in this work. Right, so when we're talking about artificial neural networks, there are different ways of thinking about them. So, so what is an artificial neural network? Um, most people will think about it as some sort of AI technology inspired by the human brain that can make decisions. So some kind of a artificial human brain um, but you can just as uh, easily think about it as a mathematical model that can represent an arbitrary nonlinear function that maps numerical inputs to outputs. And I presume that the mathematical audience here will, will see neural networks in that way. But whichever way you look at them or understand them, um, we know that they are extremely successful in many practical applications. So applications such as um, image recognition, being able to identify a person in a crowd or being able to um, identify whether an image contains a car or not, um, doing a stock exchange prediction, speech recognition and so on. So they're very pervasive and um, we know that they're very successful. Um, right, so why do they work so well? and sometimes fail very badly. So um, if we look at that little picture that I have there of the, the cat, um, there's, we know that the neural networks are very successful at identifying certain objects. So a neural network can now, it's a few years ago, it was a very hard task. Nowadays, it's a trivial task to identify when an image contains a cat or not. So the output of the neural network would say that well there's a, a 90 like a 97% chance of of or probability of the image containing a cat or in a 1% probability of containing a, a dog and so on 
Um, but we also know that, that there are cases where, um, where neural networks fail horribly. So here's an example from a news feature in Nature um, called Why Deep Learning AIs Are So Easy to Fool, where we have an image of a stop sign, which is correctly identified as a stop sign by a neural network. But if you just rotate it to the right, then suddenly the neural network thinks it's a dumbbell. And if you rotate it and, and um, translate it, then you end up thinking that it's a, a racket. Um, the, the, well, the neural network is fooled. And in this way, we've realized that there are many neural network applications where they, we think that they're thinking or reasoning in the way a human brain reasons, but we realize actually, although it, it's very successful, there's something else happening inside the black box that is easily fooled by trivial examples, which would be uh, very easy for a human brain to identify. So the bottom line is that neural networks are black boxes. And this is not only to the common public out there, but also to the experts. Jan Kuhn is uh, one of the forefathers of deep neural networks. And um, he, in, he got the Turing Award for his, with, with other with colleagues um, for his work in um, deep neural networks. And he's currently the director of AI research at Facebook. He's, uh, in 2015, he said that the vast majority of practical applications of deep learning focus on supervised learning, where the supervised loss function is minimized using stochastic gradient descent. The properties of this highly convex loss function, such as its landscape and the behavior of critical points are, however, very poorly understood. So we, although neural networks are wonderfully successful and applied everywhere, there's still a lack of understanding as to what is actually happening inside the, the black box. So the focus of this talk is, is on neural networks and trying to shed some light into that black box. So if we view neural network training as an optimization task, then we can analyze the search space using established approaches from the evolutionary computation community, which we call fitness landscape analysis. And that's where I've done most of my research. Um, but it, I've done most of my research in fitness landscape analysis, but in understanding optimization problems in general. But the focus of this talk is, is seeing how can we use these techniques in um, understanding neural network training. So the idea is to characterize the spaces to better understand the nature of the training task and to understand why some algorithms or architectures or strategies perform better than others on particular problems. So I'm going to talk about neural network training as an optimization problem and the notion of a neural network errors landscape. Then I will briefly look at some of the fitness landscape analysis techniques from the evolutionary computation community. Then I'm going to look at how we can apply um, this to neural network error landscapes to answer some of the questions about this, about the black box and, and look at some recent research that's in progress. So if we think about neural network training, um, a neural network is just um, a bunch of inputs and outputs and between the inputs and outputs are these things that we call neurons. And the essential learning happens in those links between the neurons. So there's all those little arrows and associated with each arrow is a weight. And so in this way, we can combine the weights, combine the inputs in different ways by giving them different weights to say this input is more important when it is considered with this other input. And so the, the numbers attached to all those weights are what are adjusted during training. And during that training, so the, the purpose is to minimize what we call the error of the, land, of, the, of the neural network. And the error of the neural network is simply the sum of the differences between the targets. And the target is, is, is where we, while we talk about supervised learning. So we, let's say we've got an image of a, of a cat and that the pixels of the image are the input into the neural network. The output would be 
um, the neural network's prediction, which is what we call the, the OKP, <laughs> that's the output of whether, uh, whether the neural network thinks that it's a cat or not. And then the, the target is what we know. So we, we know we have these labeled um, data instances that tell us uh, this is a cat and this is not, and this other image is not a cat. So we have the difference between what the network produces and what we know it should, what answer it should give. And in that way, it, it, it tries, the neural network in training tries to minimize the error in order to match the targets to the outputs. So it's really just an optimization problem. And most of the training happens using this algorithm called gradient descent, which is really a local search algorithm, a form of local search algorithm. But if you think about the weight space, as if we hear this in this picture, I've just got a very simple um, single weight. So if we, do you see my cursor when I go up and down like this or not? Can somebody just tell me, do you see my cursor or don't you? Just do it again, Catherine. If I do this, or must I do this? Yes, we can see it, yeah. We see it there. Okay, so if it's on my big screen, if I move it, right. So this, if we look at the horizontal axis here, this is the, if we had only a single weight in the neural network, and we wanted to, it currently had, let's say it had the value of, of three, which is sitting here. And then we wanting to move it towards, we wanting to increase its value so that the error is minimized. So if we can measure the error using a, a function, which we can do by feeding data through the neural network, we get that error. Um, now the principle with gradient descent is that we can actually analytically obtain the gradient of this error function because the error function is simply um, a combination, a linear combination of the inputs multiplied by the weights and pushed through what we call an activation function. And we know the derivative of the activation function so we can minimize the error. So the bottom line is each weight is adjusted um, in the direction of the negative gradient in order to try and minimize this error. So this optimization problem is actually, and mathematically speaking, it's quite a trivial exercise. So what we do with, uh, uh, in, when we're looking at these landscapes is we're trying to understand what is the nature of these error landscapes. So there I had a little picture of a single weight, but, but the weights in a neural network have there are many thousands of net weights usually. So every, when we're talking about an error landscape, what we mean is that every weight vector is associated with an error value. So when we talk about a weight vector, we just mean the combination of all the weights in the neural network. So let's say our neural network has 800 weights. It's an 800 valued vector and each weight has a, has a, a, is a real number. And with, with each possible combination of those 800 weights, you can obtain an error by, by um, putting the training data through the neural network with those weights to measure the error. And then, so the dimensionality of the search space of, of neural network training is equal to the number of weights in your network. So the question is, if we could visualize these high dimensional spaces, what would they look like? So we, we know that they don't look like that. That is what we call a simple, uh, that would be the simplest um, landscape to search because it's nice and smooth and it's got one global optimum. So if we want to find the, the minimum error, we simply navigate down to the bottom of the, of the bowl and there we have our best solution to the neural network. Now we know that they don't look like that. Um, now I say if we could visualize it, but obviously we're talking about a, a multi-dimensional weight space, so we can't see it. But if we could see it, if there were only two weights, we know it wouldn't look like that. But the question is, does it look a bit like this? You know, are there these multiple, is it a rugged landscape? Are there these multiple local optima? Or does it look more like this? Now this is a, that third picture is a actual neural network with only two weights. Um, and we see there that the, 
it's got these flat sections and these ridges. So, so we know that we, we think that if we look at very simple landscapes of neural networks, that they have these, what we call plateaus, these flat sections, and they also have these ridges, but we're not sure because this is only in two dimensions. Right, so if we go to the theory, because these are analytical gradients, so we should be able to theoretically determine what's the nature of these search bases, but the, the, the results from the theoretical analysis are very really contradictory. So here's one study in 1988 by Baldy and Hornick. They looked at a layered linear feedforward neural network. And their, their conclusion was that a unique minimum, um, that it has a unique minimum. In other words, there are no local optima. There's only one global optima. So it's like a big bowl shape. Um, and that, but that all of the critical points are saddle points. So we have these saddle points, there's no, there are no local optima. Then we have another study done later in 1996 on a single neuron with a logistic function as the activation function. And they found that the number of local minima grow exponentially um, in the dimension. We have another study done on the XOR Function. Now, the XOR function is a trivial um, neural network learning task that is often used as a benchmark because it is so simple, but it is, it's very simple, but it's also complex in that it is what we call non-linearly separable. But the point is, it's a very simple function. It's only got two inputs and one output. And it, the, here they prove in 1998 that there are no local minima. Um, and a later study in 2018 found that the number of local minima grow rapidly with the number of nodes in the network. So we have this, these theoretical studies that show that, uh, that, that, that give us contradictory results. So we don't know what these landscapes, what the features are of these landscapes, even the very simple ones. So we turn to fitness landscape analysis, but I want to first, before I carry on, ask if there are any questions at this stage. Any questions or should I just move on? Um, nobody's raised their hand, so I think there's okay. nothing in the chat. So yeah, go, go for it. So now we, I want to just tell you briefly about fitness landscape analysis as a field so that you know what it, where it comes from, what it's about. So it was started back in 1932 in the evolutionary computation community. I mean, not evolutionary community, evolutionary biology community. So the biologists, came, Sewell Wright came up with this idea of thinking of a landscape in order to understand how evolution changes, to understand the, the mechanisms of evolution in the natural world. But since then we've used, it's been used extensively in um, evolutionary computation communities. So in other words, people using genetic algorithms and so on to understand how the algorithms behave because it's the same principles um, as evolution, many of the, of the uh, evolutionary algorithms use the same principles as, as evolution in nature. But the essential elements of uh, a fitness landscape are just a set of potential solutions, which is our search phase. So, so whatever our optimization problem is, what are the, the possible solutions? Some might be good, some might be bad. And a way of measuring how good they are, which is the fitness function, and that fitness function could be based on simulation. It doesn't have to be a nice mathematical function. Um, and the third thing we need for fitness landscapes is the notion of neighborhood or accessibility. So what that means is if we've got two solutions to an optimization problem, do we know how close they are to each other? Do we know if, if they are far apart and so on? So this idea that you, that you have a notion of neighborhood. Now, if you're dealing with continuous um, variables in your problem, it makes sense that three is close to four, closer to four than to 10, 
But when you're dealing with solutions to say traveling salesman problem, then it's it's a little bit more complicated to say that this route is um, closer to another route than a, than a third route. But it's still the same idea that if the solutions differ quite a lot in terms of how they are made up, then we say that they are far apart as opposed to close together. So that is important in terms of landscape analysis that we have this notion of neighborhood. So intuitively, you can think of a fitness landscape as a visualization um, where you can see how the fitness changes, where the vertical dimension of the visualization is the fitness. But of course, we can't always visualize them because you can only do that if we have two two variables and normally we have hundreds of variables so but, it, but we can imagine it in our brains as if we've got two solutions that are close to each other what is happening to the fitness is it changing uh, in a very sudden way or is it make are there lots of changes happening or is it very smooth the way the changes are happening and so on so we have this idea of valleys and peaks and ridges and plateaus um, in the landscape but because we can't visualize them, what we do is we numerically characterize them. So we can say that this, the problem, the second problem here in, in, my, in these pictures that I have, this one has a, a ruggedness of say, no, a ruggedness of zero, whereas this one has a ruggedness of 0 0.8 or something. So, so we have a way of, of saying that, that, of quantifying the features in a, in a landscape. So we have many different types of features in the landscape. The one is just how smooth is the landscape, how rugged is the landscape, how what we have this notion called deception, which is if we have a solution here in the landscape, the information around it in the neighborhood tells it that it should be going that way to find a solution. But in fact, the better solution is in the other direction. So that's what we call deception. Neutrality is when there is no information in the neighborhood. So the, in this solution here, we have um, in its neighborhood, it doesn't tell us which way to go, whether we should be increasing X or decreasing X because the fitness isn't changing in its neighborhood. Um, but we also know that What's important is the, what we call the distribution and relative sizes of the basins of attraction. What that means is here we have two examples. This example here has two local optima and one global optima. Here we have three, two, local, two local optima and one global optima. But so although they have the same number of optima, this one is much more difficult than this one because of the global structure. So we have here what we call multiple funnels. So it's not just simply a case of how many optima there are, which is what the theoretical results were telling us in neural network in the in the analysis of neural networks, saying there are there is one minima or there are many minima. It's not about that as so much as how they are distributed across the search space. Right, so in terms of fitness landscapes, we, we, what we've done in the evolutionary computation community over the last 20 years is we've been developing many techniques, um, or more like the last eight years. Uh, we've been developing many techniques to characterize these different features of landscapes. Um, and they would be defined for particular search spaces. So you might have a technique that only works on binary search spaces and one that only works on continuous spaces. But most will be based on a form of sampling of the search space. So you will, your search space is too big. And so what you do is you sample it in some sort of way using either a random walk or doing some sort of uh, probability distribution. And then you try and produce numerical outputs or visualizations to better understand the nature of the space that is too complex to visualize. So examples are autocorrelation, fitness distance correlation, entropic measures of raggedness, fitness clouds, and there are many of them. I'll just quickly highlight one or two here. So that's this picture here shows you an example of fitness distance correlation. Now this is a high dimensional optimization problem which is now what we're doing is we're taking a sample of solutions. So each dot in this, in this scatter plot, 
represents a solution to the problem. And the, we have the fitness on the left, on the horizontal, I mean, the vertical axis is the fitness to tell us how good is the solution and we're trying to minimize. So the better solutions are down here at the bottom of the scatter plot. And DE, the distance, this is the distance of the solution to the optimum, to the best solution in the, in the landscape. So what we have here is we have a visualization that tells us something about the nature of the search space. It shows that there seem to be two main basins of attraction because these solutions here are close to each other and they are not as good as the solutions in this basin. And it looks like the second, the, the, the non-optimal basin is a bit wider than the other optimal basin. So yeah, we're using a visualization te technique in two dimensions that tells us something about the structure of the space in higher dimensions. Um, another example is entropic measures of ruggedness. And here we, we have a way of extracting a single number between 0 and 1 to quantify the ruggedness. So I, I don't need to explain how it works, but the point is that you can see here that Zakharov has a ruggedness of 0 0.237 whereas Alpine has a ruggedness of 0.6 and Weierstrass as a benchmark function has a ruggedness of 0.7. So we can say that this function is more rugged than that function and this is based on a sampling of the search phase. And so although we can't see the functions, we know that we know something about them by extracting these metrics. Another example of a fitness landscape analysis technique is what we call um, uh, local optima networks. Our local optima networks are an, an approach that um, extracts the most important information of a search space. So here in these graphs, it's a graph based techniques. In these graphs, each node of the graph is a local optima. And this is actually the traveling salesman problem. So it's the search space of a really complex traveling salesman problem. So each dot or each node in this graph is actually a, a root. And the size of the nodes is got to do with how many solutions, um, how big is the, how, how big of an attractor it is. So in other words, there are many solutions that are close by that will lead you to the suboptimal one, which is visualized over there. It's that, that orange dot. So this is just a, this, the, the last image over here on the right is actually just a 3D visualization of the same 2D graph on the left. And so this is showing us the structure of the landscape of a search space that we can't visualize because it's, 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 it's uh, traveling salesman solutions, which are a, um, a, 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 a sequence of cities. So it's, it's an unvisualizable search space, which we can visualize using this landscape analysis approach to see what, what is the nature of the search space. Right, any questions at this stage? Or can I go on to how do we apply these techniques to neural networks now? No questions, is it? No, I don't think so, no. Right, okay, so I'll keep going. So now the, now the uh, focus is on saying, okay, how do we use these approaches with neural networks? So firstly, neural network training is not a typical optimization problem. So when we're dealing with, with optimization problems, um, we have these nice benchmarks, and an example is illustrated here, which is the, this is called Schwefel 2.26. But it's just a benchmark function that we use for testing our evolutionary algorithms. And it's plotted here in two dimensions, but it can be scaled to any dimension. So it's a nice scalable function. And maybe if we look, do a study on high dimensional functions, we might give it, it, put it up to 30 dimensions, and then it becomes this really hard problem. And, but it has these nice bounds, so it's only defined from minus 500 to 500 in each x value, and so on. So there's a nice problem. But when we're dealing with neural networks, we have a different situation. So 
one of the issues is that it's very high dimensional. So if we look at MNIST, MNIST is a data set which I've illustrated here. This, these are just example training patterns um, to MNIST. MNIST is a data set classification problem which tries to, it uses a neural network, you can use a neural network to decide when a handwritten, what digit a handwritten digit is. So it will, if you feed that top left image of the little hand drawn three, does it know that this is a three and not an eight, for example. So this is the MNIST uh, uh, classification problem, which is a common benchmark used for, for neural networks. Now, if we take MNIST, which is a, it's kind of a simple problem in a way for in, in the neural network community, that would give you, and if we only use 10 hidden, neuron, hidden neurons in a network, which is not a big network at all, it's a small network, that will give us 7,960 weights. So just that simple problem has a, a search space, we're talking about a, a search space of close to 8,000 variables, which is something we don't normally deal with in the evolutionary computation community. So, so I'm saying that the neural networks are different because they're so high dimensional. Another difference is that the evaluation of the objective is expensive. So every time we're wanting to find out what is the fitness of a single instance of a neural network, we have to run all the training data through the network in order to calculate the error for the whole training data, training data set. So it, that's computationally expensive. Um, the other thing is that the search space of weights is unbounded. So when we're dealing with benchmark functions, normal benchmark factors like the Schreffel function is nicely bounded from minus 500 to 500, but in weight space, weights can take on any value. There are no bounds on the weights. So that makes it tricky. There's also redundancy in solutions because um, one, two neural networks with, with different weights might give you the same error. One solution with the same architecture can have different objective values. In other words, even the same network with the same architecture can give you one error value depending on which data patterns you give it. So if you've got a slightly different training set, you, might, you will end up with a different error value. So it's not like a nice mathematical function which always gives us the same answer. The other issue is that the global optimum in the training landscape is not equal to, not necessarily equal to the global optimum in the test landscape. I'll come back to that later. It's, a, it's an issue that we, that we're working with. And the other interesting aspect of neural network training as an optimization problem is that we actually have the gradient information. In many optimization problems, we don't have the gradient, but we do for in neural networks. So this is one of the things that makes it kind of easier in a way because we can use the gradient information. Right, so how do we apply fitness landscape analysis to neural networks? Um, one of the ways that we do it, okay, so we, the idea is to take a sample um, from weight space. So we do a random walk through weight space. If we consider the search space of all weights combined, uh, we take a walk through that space, take a walk, <laughs> or we just take a sample using some probability distribution. And when we've got that sample, we can, we can use our standard landscape analysis techniques to derive features. But we also have the analytical gradient. So at any one point, we can, we can query the gradient and find out when, it, when do we have a stationary point? Because the stationary point is when the gradient is zero. Now we know that stationary points can either meet minima, uh, where there's uh, um, convex curvature or maxima, um, and that depends on the eigenvalues, so of the, the Hessian matrix. So we can query that and find out, are we dealing with a local minimum? Are we dealing with a local maximum? Or are we dealing with the saddle point? And, or we can, if, if the stationary point, if it's a, a neutral area, then when it's a singular Hessian, then we have the case where we're dealing with plateaus. So we're able to analytically characterize random solutions uh, based on the gradient information. I hope this makes sense. Right, so some of the studies that have been done. So one of the studies that we did in 
2016 is we looked at how do more layers affect the error landscape. So in other words, if we're making the neural network deeper, we're putting in not just one layer, maybe two layers or three layers, four layers, how does that affect the landscape? And what we found is that deeper networks, neural networks, but fully connected neural networks, results in, in less rugged, flatter landscapes, but with more treacherous cliffs and ravines. So this confirms this, this notion that we have this vanishing gradient phenomenon in, in deep neural networks, where if the networks become really deep, you end up in the situation where there are a lot of um, uh, places where there is no gradient and no gradient is a real problem for gradient descent because gradient descent doesn't know what to do when it's flat. It assumes that when it's flat, it's now got to the minimum, but it might just be a, ma a massive plateau and it has to get across and it doesn't know which way to go. So that's one of the results that we, that we found. Another study that we did was how do landscape characteristics differ when using classification error versus mean squared error? So what we found is that if you're using classification error, in other words, it's a different way of measuring the, the error of the landscape, of the, of the neural network task. When you're using classification error, there's less information for search. So it's better not to train using something like classification error. It's better to train using mean squared error. Although in the end, you will use classification error to decide on how well your network is working. But with during training, it's better to use the mean squared error. Another study that was done was to look at the effect of regularization. That is when, you, when you're putting together a neural network and you're trying to make it a simpler model by penalizing many weights. So with regularization, they found that um, this results in a smaller landscape, um, while a smoother landscape while introducing additional minima. So in this way, we, the, a number of studies that are looking at, look, we're trying to understand what happens if we do this or if we do that, what's the, how does this affect the training task by analyzing the landscape. Here's another example where we looked at, we wanted to know if neural network landscapes, we know that there is flatness, but we want to know where is it flat. So here we measured what we call neutrality. So using, land, using uh, random walks. So what, what we have here is on the vertical axis of this graph is a measure of flatness. So in other words, one means that it is uh, very flat and naught means that it's not flat at all. Um, so we're talking about flatness increasing, neutrality increasing, and on the horizontal axis here we have x max, and x is just the value of the neuron, so of the weights of the, of the neurons. So what we found here is that there is a section when x is between 1 and 10, so when the magnitude of the, of the weights are between 1 and 10, there is no flatness. But around the origin, around zero, there is some flatness in the landscape. And then also as the weights become very big, so as um, the weights get bigger than 10 uh, in numerical value, we find that then the landscapes become flatter. And this, con this is, uh, confirms the existing insight into landscapes, in into neural networks. They talk about uh, neuron saturation, where you get to a point where um, the, 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 land the um, weights are big, and if you change their value, it makes no difference. So you, 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 you get into a part of the landscape where there's no information because it's flat. Right, so this is just an example. Here's another, another interesting uh, study that was done by Anna and colleagues, um, looking at are they local optima or not. Now this is this, if you think back to the, what I mentioned about the theoretical insights showing that on the XOR problem, there are um, 
Some studies said that, said that there are local optima, and other studies said that there are no local optima. There's only one global optimum. Now, what we see here is, is this is what we call a, fit, a loss gradient cloud. And this is, we have on the vertical axis, we have a, um, the gradient norm. In other words, this is saying how, um, we, if the gradient norm is zero, it means that we've, we've hit a, a part in the landscape where the, where the landscape is flat. So at that point, it's either a minima or it's a maxima or it's a saddle point or it's flat. So if we look at whether, um, if, it's, if it's convex, we're talking about it being a local minima. If it's a saddle point, it's not a local minima. Now, what this study showed is that with one hidden layer, the XOR problem had one, two, three, four local, uh, at four minima. And as the number of layers increase, we end up with no minima. We only end up with saddle points. So, so what, what, what this is showing is basically it's a, it's a way of visualizing the properties of the landscape in a very high dimensional space. Um, which provides insight into the, into the training problem. Right, so now to, just to end off, I see I've got five minutes left. Um, I want to talk about some research in progress. So that, that was all research that was already been done and published. Now I'm gonna talk about two studies that we're doing that which we haven't published yet, it's, we're still busy with. The one study that, we, that I'm doing is with, in collaboration with researchers from the University of Stirling in Scotland and, and the University of Lisbon in Portugal. We're looking at error landscapes, but in the search space of architectures for neural networks. And in particular, convolutional neural networks. Now convolutional neural networks are um, a very, have been used a lot in, um, for image classification problems, it's it's quite a different idea from um, normal feedforward neural networks. But what it has is, is we have the normal feedforward network at the end here, but at the beginning there are these multiple layers, the convolutional layers, which basically filter the image into different parts, and it's it's a way of finding. Um, different of matching kind of different parts of images. So it breaks up the image um, into elements so that, and the elements are matched in a, in a very broad sense. So the problem with convolutional neural networks is it's not trivial to know how to set them up. So how many filters do you have in the first convolutional layer? How many convolutional layers do you have? How many, what activation function do you use in this layer? What activation function do you use at the end? Do you use dropout or not? And so there are lots of questions relating to the architecture of the, of the neural network. So in this research, we're looking at the search space of the architectures of the neural networks, not the search space of the weights. And the question we're looking at is, what do these landscapes look like? And is it sensible to try and find the global optimum? Because what we actually, what preliminary results are showing is that when, when the, we get to the area where we've got good networks, there's an inverse correlation between between the fitness of the, um, the networks from the training data compared to the networks from the testing data. So it's, we, we're doing this, so this is a very exciting new project that I'm working on. Another project that I'm working on with, with Anna and Jared Moses at, at the University of Pretoria is to look at generative adversarial networks. Now this is another kind of network um, that is used to generate data that um, it's a, it generates data in an unsupervised way, but it, the idea is to resemble, resemble real data. So just to give you an idea, here's a, 
Here's an um, output from, a, at the bottom of this picture, it's output from a, the, what we call the generator of the uh, GAN, let's just say GAN for generative adversarial networks. The genera it generates an image, it starts off by generating a pure random e um, image, and over time it's able to generate something that looks like a, a handbag. And it only does that by getting feedback from another neural network called the discriminator that its job it is to tell the fakes from the real ones. So there are these two networks that work together to try and um, work in, against each other. The one is trying to fool the other one and the other one is trying to discriminate between the fakes and the real ones. And so we end up with a network that is able to generate ran, generate images that look like other images that it's that it hasn't ever seen before. So it's it's a very interesting idea, an interesting technology. And what we're doing here is we're looking at the landscapes of these of these GANs and looking at how different the generators' landscapes look from the discriminators' landscapes. So this is the second night interesting project that we're busy with. Right, so in conclusion, neural network landscapes, error landscapes are very poorly understood, still very poorly understood. There's conflicting results from the um, theoretical studies. And this black box nature of neural networks is a problem not only because the resulting behavior is unexpected and so on, but also because if we can't trust neural networks, how are we going to, how is the, uh, how are we going to trust them to do important tasks in our, in our lives? So fitness landscape analysis is, a, is an approach that, that could be useful here. And, and here we are trying to analyze these, these problems so that we can better understand and have new insight into the way that training works and just to make it more predictable. There are many new research developments, but there's plenty of scope for further research. It's a very open field at this stage. So just before I, I finish off, I just want to mention that we've got a, I'm editing a, a, a special issue of a journal, the journal called Algorithms. And we have the special issue is on benchmarking, selecting and configuring learning and optimization algorithms. So if anybody in this audience is working in this field and you have, um, you have some research, please consider submitting it to our special issue the deadline is on the 30th of November. Right, I'm going to stop there and answer questions. Wonderful, thank you so much, Catherine. Um, we've got some, we've got a couple of people ready to ask questions. Um, the first is from Jeffrey. He's written to, me, to us in the chat. Um, and his question is, is there any characterization of the landscapes which arise from ANNs? You're muted, by the way. Yes, there yes. We go. Yeah. Is there any characterization of the landscapes which arise from ANNs? Yeah, so ANNs is, is what, I, what I've been talking about. That <laughs> maybe I haven't made it clear, but the, the, are there any? So, so when we analyze the landscapes of ANNs, we looking for particular features. So we might be saying, is it rugged? Are there plateaus? Are there, you know, um, uh, steep gradients, those kinds of things. So what we're finding in neural networks that is different from other optimization algorithms is there are these things, these um, ridges so, they, so they, we're finding that the features that are more prevalent in neural network error landscapes are ridges and saddle points and, um, and these kind of cliffs and then, and then plateaus. So, so I suppose that, I hope that answers the question that there are some features that we, that we see that are more prevalent in, in landscapes of neural networks as opposed to other optimization problems. Does that answer your question, Jeffrey? 
Uh, Jeffrey, I don't know if you've got a microphone. I know you're on your iPad if you want to unmute. Okay. Um, thank you very much for the seminar and thank you for the answer. The question was a mathematical one. Is there a mathematical characterization of the surfaces which arise from neural networks? A mathematical characterization. So, uh, you see, it's 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 about. Oh, okay. So, so what you, what you, okay. So for any, for any, input into the neural network, you can measure the output, and that is a mathematical function. But the problem is that for every input, you're going to get a different output. So we work with what we call the mean squared error, which is an error based on all the patterns that are input and output. So it is a mathematical function, um, but it is based on data. Does that answer your question? Um, thank you. The surface, um, yeah. you could analyze it as a differentiable manifold, but it's not smooth, so that won't work. But you've got a topological manifold because you've emphasized neighborhoods. You've also got Hausdorff dimension in terms of wrinkles and things like that. So I mean a mathematical characterization. I understand. I'm not a mathematician. <laughs> I don't know about these things. You see, so I, I, I'm sure that one could, but, but um, yeah, I would have, I, I don't know. Because I, I, I don't work in that space. You know, we, we look at samples and we look at the characteristics of the samples. Yes. So you'd okay, have to go and read all the theoretical thank analysis you. on neural network error land. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I understand it was from a slightly different angle, but thank you for your answer. Okay, pleasure. Thanks, Catherine. Um, I've got David Rose. Yes. With a question. David, if you'd like to unmute your microphone. Thanks, yeah. Um, that was a really, really interesting uh, uh, seminar, Prof. I just wanted to know, you do briefly mention about black box. Um, can you maybe talk to it and, uh, you know, the research you've done, if there's any way of uh, whitening inverted commas, the black box? Because um, it still seems to be a bit controversial, but there also have been some solutions suggested. So, as I say, I was just interested in your angle on that. Yeah, okay. So, the, the black box nature is, is if, let me go back to one of my previous slides. Oops, sorry. Um, I just want to bring up that cat image because that shows it nicely. The, okay, so here we have we, we have the cat. So the we, they talk about the neural network as a black black box because the image the, there's you can exactly characterize the mathematical function you can write it out of a particular instance of a neural network. It's just a very big function because there are lots of weights. But the point is that. It, it's black box in that we don't know how the weights change. The, the, the training of the network changes the weights so that it makes a decision in a particular way. So if we end up with a, with a particular, um, you know, uh, instance of a neural network. Now, why it, be, it becomes a black box is because we don't know what it's base the neural network we don't know how is it basing its learning you know we know we can explain gradient descent and we can explain how the weights change but what is it looking at to decide that that is a cat you know what what is it how is it you know it's not working the way a human brain works so that's why we say it's a black box because we don't really know and what people have done in in terms of the convolutional neural networks, they, they have these filters that are, are, are trained. So you train the filters. So they look at those as images to see what is the neural network picking up as important sub-features, 
So, so may, let's say, for example, there's a there's the feature that there's a little, almost like a little triangle here, that there is a triangle in the image that sort of matches the shape of a of a cat's ear. And then, so they will see, ah, there's a triangle that's emerged in the neural network as one of the filters that will be used to match other features to see if there's a kind of a triangle shape. Um, so, so in some ways, the black box is being opened up by researchers looking into trained neural networks to see what they've come up with. But to a large extent, we don't know what goes on in there, you know, how, how it makes the decisions. And so, so what, the way we're looking in the back box is to say, okay, what's the nature of the search space so that when it doesn't work, we can say, okay, it hasn't worked because the search space looked like this. It would be better to use this other approach which, which has a better search space. Uh, for finding solutions. I don't know if that makes sense. So, the, yeah, there are different ways of looking inside the black box. Um, and some people are doing it in, in different ways, in visual ways, and so on. Thanks for that. Uh, what, I'm, uh, what I was also getting to is the fact that how if, okay, so images aside, if you're just, for example, trying to to create a regression or classification uh, results, yes. how do you convince a person that, you know, like you might have a statistical or mathematical formula or something that clearly demonstrates that this is the minimum because you've done a, de a derivative, et cetera, et cetera. But how do you convince particular people or that, um, how should we say, um, not convinced about AI and, and uh, neural networks and so on, machine learning, uh, that the answer you produce is actually legitimate, that you have actually solved the problem. Because, for example, in the financial world, and banks and so on, they like to stick with something like the regression. Really and, uh, yeah. you know, Sorry? I was just going to say, and uh, now people are trying to introduce these more modern methods, but there's a, a kind of a... Um, an, 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 um, antagonistic or a... Um, anti-feeling uh, anti against these uh, new methods because they also have this black box element to them. Yes, yes. And that, that, that's a big part of, of, I mean, the ultimate aim for us, from my side, is to say, can we prevent failure? Do, do we know when, when they fail completely, do we know why they're failing and maybe we can do different things that they don't fail like this. But, but on another side, there's the whole area of research which is saying we need to be able to explain what's happening here so that we can show that it's logical. Um, you know, but, but that's, yeah, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a huge problem because it can be very stupid sometimes. And even the real experts like the Lacun and Bungio, they've maybe they've said themselves, we we know that they do stupid things sometimes, but we didn't expect it to be stupid in this way. They, they'll say things like that. You know, so even the people who've designed these these technologies are a little bit in the dark. So it, it's a massive problem. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you, David, for the question. Um, Fry Mlombo from VIT has got his hand, oh, has raised his hand. Fry, if you'd like to come forward. Yeah, th 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 thanks, Prof, for the very interesting presentation. I think uh, uh, it was uh, quite good. Tell me, Prof, in terms of um, the architecture, yes. um, um, I mean, I, I, I've been playing with the neural networks as well. Uh, you know, uh, my training is in stats and all that. Yes. But um, I find this idea of um, knowing uh, what architecture you, have, you use for certain things to be something that is not um, perhaps well documented. Is there any perhaps uh, references you could? Uh, yes, um, that, yeah. yeah. That's a, it's a big the architecture, yeah. 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 The, the thing is that they, it's problem dependent. Oh, yeah, yeah. 
So the right, you can't say that this architecture is good for this problem because, you know, it, 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 you can say this architecture is good for identifying cats. <laughs> but you can't really go further than that because, um, yeah. you know, maybe it will be good at, at detecting dogs. But but don't don't expect it to be good at detecting you know road signs. So so it really is a problem, uh, um, and that's why I, we started to work in this architecture space because it's an interesting space because it's become part of. There's this whole area of, of research called auto ML, which is automatic auto? machine learning. Auto ML. Auto ML is 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 it more like symbolic uh, stuff? No, no, it's it's basically like they're trying to automate different parts of the machine learning pipeline. Oh yeah. But it's done through trial and error. So mostly, so you so you so you have a, a um, like auto worker is a is a a tool where you can say. Um, uh, I've got this problem, find the best architecture for me and it'll find the best architecture for you, but it does it through experimentation. So oh, it's yeah. not through intelligence. Now we're trying to get to the intelligence. They're saying, if you've got a, a problem like this, then the architecture, the, the architectural search space looks like this. And so, you know, this is a good approach. Uh, we're trying to, um, if we can characterize the search spaces, hopefully we can use machine learning to develop rules to know what's the best to use in which instance. Because that's what we've done in evolutionary computation. We've done, we're doing things called automated algorithm selection, which is to say, if you've got an optimization problem that has these features, then it's best to use this algorithm because it works best. Because mm. we've known from the past, we've learned the features that are good, that are suited to different algorithms. Now we're trying to, we eventually will maybe get to that with, with neural networks, but we're not there yet. Okay, yeah, yeah, just, just a follow up. Thanks, Prof, for that um, uh, a very good uh, uh, answer there. Uh, but just to follow up on that, uh, so, I, if, if I'm just uh, trying to get to what you are doing, are we saying, I don't know if I still remember my applied math a bit, but tell me, uh, you know, if you think about um, things like uh, feasibility, uh, regions, et cetera, you know, for, for optimization problems, are we saying uh -huh. here that uh, maybe you, uh, the, the approach that you're using is more of, uh, like trying to characterize, uh, I don't know, for lack, lack of a better word, you're trying to understand okay. the, 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 the feasibility regions and things like that and see uh, uh, how that would determine maybe, um, 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 uh, I don't know if you follow what I'm trying to get to. Yes, that's yeah. a very interesting question. If we're talking about optimization, in for like other real world problems, usually there'll be constraints. Yeah. But now when we're talking about the weight space, when you're talking about training neural networks, there are no constraints because any weight values are fine. There's no infeasible neural network. But when we're talking about architecture space, then some are infeasible. You know, and it's, uh, it's interesting you say that because I've never thought about it in this way. Because the, yeah. we, 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 as we're experimenting, we're realizing that we can't, there's some architectures that you just can't get to run because they just take too long. So, so you, you know, you, it's all very well saying you need so many convolutional layers or you need so many filters, but then it's infeasible because they it can't run. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. because it just takes days and you don't have days. So, actually, yeah. it would be interesting to look at the constraints on the, on the, the feasibility of different architectures, for sure. Yeah, that's good, an good, good, idea. Good. Thank you. Yeah. Great, thank you so much, Farah, for that question. Um, we don't have any other questions coming through and um, we're running just over time. So, um, Prof, if you're happy with that, I'm going to, I'm going to end it there. 
Um, I just want to say thank you um, very much to our audience for joining us today. And thank you for the questions. Um, and a very special thank you, um, Prof Milan, for, for presenting with us today. Um, a very, very interesting um, and something, something a little bit different, which we always enjoy. So thank you so much. Um, and we wish you all the best.